Lesson 11, Hindu Wonder Working The majority of Western readers are more or less familiar with the accounts of the wonder-working feats of the Hindu Fakirs, or so-called yogis, whose feats have been witnessed by Western travelers in India, who have related wonderful accounts of what they have witnessed upon their return home. Of course, many of these accounts are exaggerated and distorted but there is a basis of agreement upon the fundamental facts which should satisfy the fair-minded Western student that there are many things in heaven and earth not dreamed of in our philosophy that is, in the philosophies of the West. All educated Hindus, however, know that while these feats are performed, that they are not supernatural in any sense of the word, but are in strict accordance with natural laws, although some of these laws may not be known to the general public and some of the applications of ordinary natural forces are strange to the Western world. Moreover, the educated Hindu knows that these exhibitions and manifestations of strange forces are not necessarily proofs of a high degree of spiritual attainment on the part of the performer, for these men are often quite low in the ranks of spiritual attainment but are rather the result of the control of certain of nature's forces by means of the development of certain psychological powers chiefly by the control and application of the will. It is true that the great spiritual masters of India the sages, adepts, or masters, are possessed of high spiritual powers which are far above those manifested by the fakirs, but these people never stoop to exhibit feats for the amusement or entertainment of the populace the very fact that a man will give an entertainment of this kind stamping him as one of the class of fakirs who work on a lower plane and who does not possess the higher powers. The secret of the fakir's power generally consists in his ability to produce a mental illusion, or a maya, whereby the senses of the bystanders are deluded and the people made to appear to witness things that have no basis in fact as we shall see as we proceed. Another class of effects are produced by the control of prana, or vital force, by the concentrated will of the performer, so that heavy objects are moved around in defiance of the law of gravitation, and even the human body at times being floated about in the air, which feat is called levitation, and is not unknown to the western world. Then the marvelous degree of development along the lines of telepathy among these people, and many of the Hindus for that matter, renders possible feats that would be practically impossible in the West. Many of these feats could be produced in no other land but India, owing to the psychological conditions maintaining there, the material mental atmosphere of Western lands tending to counteract the effects. Let us examine a few typical cases of this phenomena of wonder working in India, that we may arrive at an understanding of the methods employed. In the first place the Hindu mind by reason of the training of centuries and the mental attitude of the majority of the people, is peculiarly receptive to strongly concentrated thought waves telepathy among these people is so common a thing as to merit but scant notice. English people in India always have been aware of the fact that news and information have been and are flashed from one end of India to another in a few hours. Let some peculiar occurrence happen in one corner in India, perhaps quite remote and away from railroads and telegraphs some uprising or revolt for instance, or the appearance of some religious teacher preaching new truths and before the day is past the news will be known in every corner of the land, much to the surprise of the English residents who see that something strange is occurring, but who will not learn the true cause for several days afterward. At the time of the native uprisings and revolt, some fifty years ago, the news of each move was known all over India a few hours after the occurrence a fact which baffled the efforts of the English authorities to fathom or explain. The same is true in India of today. As all careful readers of the journals know, there is in India today a strong spirit of revolt against English rule, and there are many manifestations of unrest. Many careful observers claim that sooner or later there will be a national uprising among the Hindus, the result being that the English rule will be over the yoke cast off. As some of the Hindus say, India is a huge elephant lying asleep, beside her being her keeper a red-coated boy with a goat in his hand. Some night the elephant will roll over on the boy, and then there will be no keeper, and the goat will be useless. Well, however this may be, the fact remains that in this year 1908 there is a perfect system of telepathic news service kept up among the different parts of India whereby the various local readers of the underground movement are kept fully posted on the progress of the movement elsewhere. In the morning, in some large town, everything will be moving along as usual, 
while in the afternoon the English residents will notice strange glances being cast at them, and sneering smiles and meaning glances passing between the natives in the bazaars. Some news has been gained some word of some point of advantage secured by the plotters, and the only way that the news travels so quickly is by the telepathic route. This power of telepathy, and the receptivity to its influence on the part of the populace generally, renders a Hindu crowd susceptible of being impressed quite easily by the psychological power of the fakirs who have reduced mental concentration to a fine art, and who created a condition of mental illusion as a foundation for their more difficult feats. And not only are the natives affected by this influence, but Western people who happen to be in the crowd catch the contagion of the thought and fall victims to the psychology of the crowd as it is known in the West. All this is a kind of hypnotism or mesmeric influence, of a certain form known to the fakirs, and to those who have made a study of the subject. The crowd is placed in a suggestible condition, and filled with the expectant attention which is so important a condition for the successful carrying off of these feats. In addition to this method, the fakirs also possess the power of mental materialization in which they produce illusion by sending forth strong thought forms of that which they wish the crowd to see, and which are then apparently seen by the people witnessing the performance, although a photograph snapped at the time will fail to disclose any of the remarkable scenes being witnessed, thus proving that the effect is purely psychological. Let us describe a typical performance of this kind, by one of the best and most successful traveling fakirs of India in which the various classes of phenomena are manifested. At the beginning of the performance, which is given in the open air, in a large vacant space, the fakir seats himself on the ground in the typical Hindu fashion, his legs being folded in front of him, and his hands arranged in the style familiar to those who have seen the image of a Hindu deity in the temples, and with his eyes closed. The crowd has gathered around him, at a respectful distance, and prepares for the usual long wait. Then the assistants of the fakir, usually youths of a tender age, begin to beat cymbals and drums, not loudly but with a muffled peculiar monotonous sound. Then the fakir begins to chant slowly and drowsily, choosing words that end in amimim sounds, not a difficult thing in India, until after a bit a rhythmic vibration is set up and the air seems to quiver with its tremulous movement. Then, perhaps, the assistants will release several cobra snakes from jars, or boxes, and the serpents will writhe around in harmony with the music, and lo! They are seen swelling and struck cetera dotting and increasing in size, until at last they become as immense boa constrictors swaying before the affrighted audience then at a wave of the fakir's hand the music changes a little and the snakes begin to decrease in size until they vanish from sight entirely. This snake feat is often dispensed with by some of the leading fakirs who consider it too crude and worthy only of the lower order of performers or snake charmers. Then the fakir rises, and taking a slender long rope from his assistants, he casts the knotted end high into the air. The rope spins out its length for several minutes, rising higher and higher until the knotted end is lost to sight. Finally it stops, and the lower end is left dangling a few feet above the ground, as if suspended by some invisible hook or beam far above the ground. Then the fakir bids his smallest assistant climb up the rope, which he does, nimbly passing up and up, until he too fades from sight. Then the fakir claps his hands, and lo! The rope itself vanishes. After a wait of a few minutes the boy who has disappeared comes rushing into the circle of the crowd as if coming from a great distance, and all out of breath. Sometimes this feat is varied and terminated by the boy appearing high up in the air, as a tiny speck, and then gradually descending to the ground by means of the rope. This feat has several variations, but the general outlines are the same. Then the fakir proceeds to perform the celebrated mango feat, so often witnessed by English travelers in India. He begins by building up a little hillock of earth, into which he places a mango seed. Then he begins his chant, accompanied by the drums and cymbals, and a waving of his hands over the little pile of earth. In a few moments a little sprout of green manifests itself from the top of the pile, and growing rapidly soon reaches the height and appearance of a young mango bush, which still keeps on growing until it has reached the size and maturity of a full-grown mango tree, with leaves and blossoms. Then the blossoms change into young fruit, which ripens before the eyes of the crowd until finally it is picked and passed around the crowd to be eaten. Then the fakir reverses the process, 
and the tree begins to shrink and retire into itself until finally it has again resolved itself into the original seed which was planted in the hillock. In some cases the fakir varies the feat by bidding the people hold carefully in their hands the mangoes which he distributes, the result being that when the tree disappears the fruit disappears also. Another favorite feat of these fakirs is the spinning boy, in which he takes his young assistant and whirls him around like a top the motion growing more and more rapid until the boy spins around rapidly by himself, without assistance. Finally the spinning boy begins to ascend in the air, higher and higher, until he vanishes from sight. The feat is terminated either by the boy coming running back to the crowd from a distance, or else by a reversal of the disappearing act, and a return from the heights as a human spinning top, growing more and more distinct until the earth is again reached when he gradually slows down until he comes to a perfect rest, when he squats unconcernedly by the side of his master. The rope snake feet is another favorite manifestation of these fakirs. They will take plain bits of rope, often cutting the bits from a long thick rope, with a knife, and then knotting an end on each bit. Then begins the chant, and waving of hands, and the drum and cymbals. Soon the bits of rope begin to tremble and a moment later are seen to be slowly transforming themselves into cobra snakes. Finally the knotted end turns into the hooded head of the deadly cobra and the serpents are seen moving hissingly and threateningly toward the crowd, which retreats in terror. A word from the fakir and the snakes begin to resolve themselves back into the original bits of rope, and in the end are as they were at the beginning bits of severed rope with a knotted end, much to the relief of the spectators. Then the fakir will stand up and leaning backwards will lift his feet from the ground, until at length is seen to be floating in the air as a good swimmer floats in the water. Often he passes over the heads of the crowd, circling around until he finally returns to his original place and position. Sometimes this floating feet is varied by the fakir snatching a child or young boy from the side of its parents, and causing it to float around in the air often rising up out of sight in the manner before mentioned. There is no end to the variety of changes that these people work in performing this feat. They will also toss into the air various objects that may be lying around, and make them float easily in the air, rising and lowering themselves at the command of the fakir. The well-known coconut feat is another favorite illusion of the traveling fakirs. It is performed by producing an empty coconut shell which is passed around for examination. Then from the knot is seen to bubble up great streams of water, which is poured into a bucket then into another vessel or jar and so on until many gallons of water have been produced from the shell, and many jars filled. Then he reverses the process and slowly pours vessel after vessel of water back into the shell, where it disappears, until finally all the vessels have been emptied and the shell is again passed around perfectly empty and as dry as in the first place. There are many variations and combinations of this class of feats as performed by these traveling fakirs and others, the variety and interesting features depending materially upon the ingenuity and power of invention on the part of the fakir. As a rule, however, these people merely repeat the feats which have been taught them by their parents or masters, with little or no variation, change, or improvement their inventive faculties not been highly developed seemingly. The majority of the fakirs have served long apprenticeships with either the fathers or else with some old master fakir to whom they were apprenticed in early youth, and it is the tendency of a certain type of Hindu mind to follow an example as closely as may be, without any attempt at improvement. But here and there are to be found rather enterprising fakirs who are not satisfied with the mechanical repetition of the feats as taught them but who wish to achieve special renown by performing some new feat, or new variation on some old one. And, when this desire possesses a fakir there are no limits to the variety of feats that he produces, which, however, are mainly variations upon and combinations of the principal feats, such as are mentioned above. Some of these variations take the form of materializing objects from the air producing the forms and shapes of men, women, children and animals in short that which is similar to what in the western world are called materializations in spiritualistic seances, although there is really no connection between the two classes of phenomena, as we shall see as we proceed. There is practically no limit to the variety possible to the person possessing the ability to produce or rather to induce the elusive mental state which lies at the bottom of this class of manifestations. An enterprising western magician, were he possessed of the power of producing this illusion, 
would startle the world by sensational exhibitions of his wondrous power. But the Hindu fakir does not seem to wish to spread himself out in this way such would be contrary to the traditions of his class and race, and he prefers to move along in the same old ways that have been followed by the many generations of teacher and pupils before him for his trade is an old one, and each fakir descends in a direct line from hundreds who have preceded him, and from whom he has acquired the little knack of producing the illusion as well as the methods whereby he has acquired the power of concentration. 4. Let the truth be known, while the basis of these feats is the strong, concentrated will and mind of the fakir, trained by methods handed down from the centuries, still the details of the performance are practically those of the magician of the West, and are arranged with an eye to effect and stage business. This must be so necessarily for the fakir is a public performer and his business must be managed so as to produce the best effects. He is not filled with the scientific spirit, nor is he possessed of high spiritual ideals. He simply has come into the possession of certain methods of mental training, whereby he is able to psychologize his audience, and to project thought forms, which will seem as realities to his spectators, and he uses the power to entertain, amuse and bewilder the crowds that flock around him in his travels. Many Hindus and many Western men have endeavored to extract the secret of the process from these itinerant wonder workers, but without avail large sums of money have been offered them, but they have spurned it. The truth is that they have taken sacred oaths to the instructors to preserve the secrets of their craft, and besides they are afraid of the vengeance sure to be meted upon them by their brethren of the craft should they divulge their methods. A fakir will die rather than tell his secrets. But nevertheless the secrets are known to the advanced occultists among the Hindu sages and adepts, who are acquainted with the laws and methods of development concerning the production of the feats. But these advanced souls would not think of exhibiting these powers, as does the fakir, nor would they make the methods public for fear that they might be used for improper purposes. But there is no doubt in the minds of the Hindu investigators that the feats are mere illusions, in fact the process and general methods are known to some who have investigated closely along these lines. The fact that photographs snapped during the performance of these feats have failed to reveal anything but the fakir sitting still in the center, with his eyes fixed in a concentrated glare, and an entire absence of the many illusory features shows conclusively that the feats exist merely in the minds of the audience upon which they have been superimposed by the mind of the fakir. Many experiments in photography have been made along these lines, but the result is always the same the plate shows nothing unusual in the boy and rope feet there is seen no rope, no boy, no climbing, nothing but the fakir sitting still and concentrating, concentrating, concentrating. Moreover, other experiments have been made along these lines. It has been discovered, accidentally, that if the spectators move in too close upon the fakir the illusion vanishes from the minds of those approaching him, although remaining as fresh and strong as ever in the minds of those remaining in the charmed circle. And the same is true in the case of those who retreat beyond a certain distance of the circle. People have tried this experiment in numerous cases, and with the same result. Moreover, some have witnessed the performance from the roofs of buildings higher than the average, and have seen nothing unusual, while their friends on the ground have witnessed all the strange and wonderful features above narrated. There can be no doubt that herein lies the secret of the phenomena. But, even though these feats be merely illusion, and not a reversal of nature's laws, is it not wonderful that such psychological power can have been cultivated and developed? It shows the possibilities of practice and concentration of the mental powers, of which the Western world is just beginning to understand. The West is merely in the kindergarten stage of the power of the mind, but we venture the assertion that the American spirit of investigation will bring many new things to light along these lines within the next 20 years the investigators are on the right track already and wonderful possibilities are before the race. And, now, let us pass on to a consideration of the higher class of phenomena of the Hindu wonder workers, of which the Western world is not so well informed as of the above-mentioned class exhibited by the fakirs. For there is a higher phase, possessing real scientific interest, and manifesting a wonderful control and management of the powers of nature, along the lines of vital forces, etc and which is devoid of the illusory nature of the fakir's feats. The Western world made out some of these higher feats, but many Hindus, and a few Western travelers, know them to be facts. 
among the instances of the exercise of a high degree of control over some of nature's forces, along scientific lines, and devoid of the illusory features of the phenomena previously mentioned, is that of the celebrated boiling water feat which has been witnessed and reported by several Western writers and travelers, but which is not nearly so common as the class of phenomena due to mental illusion. The feat is performed as follows. The fakir takes between the palms of his hands a glass, or other vessel or receptacle, filled with clear water both the water and the receptacle having been examined by the witnesses of the performance. Then, showing signs of mental concentration, and at the same time practicing the yogi rhythmic breathing, the fakir seems to be sending to the water a current of power or force of some sort. In a few moments the water seems to be filled with tiny bubbles similar to those showing in boiling water and gradually the entire glass is bubbling away as if a great heat were being applied to it. Investigators have then insisted that the glass be placed on a table away from the hands of the fakir, the result being that the ebullition gradually subsided, and the glass of water resumed its normal appearance, with the exception that tiny bubbles of air gathered and remained on the sides of the glass, just as they do in ordinary instances when a glass of water is allowed to remain for a length of time. It is said by those who have experimented with this phenomenon, that the water does not grow hot, nor does it really boil in the sense of being agitated by heat, the appearance being that of effervescence rather than that of boiling by heat. It should be noted here that the investigators took steps to prevent the insertion of any effervescent chemical into the water in some cases the precautions taken being so great that the investigators brought their own glasses, which they filled themselves, and then covered carefully, in one case a covered mason jar being used to obviate any change or the insertion of any chemical substance into the water. In one instance, we understand, the water was connected with a registering instrument similar to a galvanometer and no signs of an electric current were observed and in the same test the water was subjected to a chemical analysis, but no traces of foreign chemical substances were found. Some have remarked that the water seemed to be slightly warmer than that of the water before the manifestation upon it, but this may have been caused by the national heat of the hands of the fakir. We have heard of no cases in which the heat has been recorded by the use of a thermometer. Some have thought that after the manifestation the water tasted flat as does water that has been subjected to boiling, in fact this seems to be the general verdict, but there is a chance of the effect of auto-suggestion or imagination in this case, in absence of any scientific test. As to the genuineness of the phenomenon of the effervescing or boiling, however, there seems to be no doubt, some of the fakirs performing the above feat, when closely questioned, insisted that they were unable to explain what force was used as they merely concentrated their minds on the water, according to methods taught by their instructors and masters, and the result followed naturally. Some attempted to give some fantastic explanation, or to account for the phenomena by the theory of spirits, but these people were suspected of endeavoring to surround the phenomenon with supernatural fringes, and a close cross-examination generally resulted in their admitting that they did not understand the real cause underlying their work they knew that it worked and that was all. Others, however, who were better informed, held that it was caused by the manifestation of prana under the control of their concentrated will, and assisted by their rhythmic breathing, and such is the opinion of Hindu occultists who are familiar with the phenomenon and who claim that it is merely a simple manifestation of the operation of prana generated by the rhythmic breath, and directed by the focused will, in short, it is merely a more marked manifestation of the same natural force which is employed in the production of the magnetized water so frequently employed by the magnetic healers of the Western world. We have heard of experiments performed privately by advanced occultists who were investigating the force producing effects of water subjected to concentrated prana, in which the vessel containing the water was connected by a pipe attached to a miniature toy steam engine boiler the result being that when the effervescence began to manifest in a high degree the tiny boiler was filled with the steam, or other ethereal form of matter arising from the water, and the little engine began to work. We never have witnessed this experiment, personally, but have heard of several cases of its having been performed in India. In these cases, however, the persons capable of exerting the force declined to exhibit the feat in public, having no desire for notoriety or fame. 
the Hindu mind working along lines of its own in this respect and which are foreign to the Western point of view which sees the advantage and virtue of publicity. The Orientals hold firmly to the idea that the truth is for the favored few who can appreciate it. The Westerner holds that truth should be spread widely among all, irrespective of the capacity to understand and correctly apply it to the best advantage. Each view has its own arguments and merits and the real wisdom probably lies in the middle of the road between the two. Another feat which has caused much interest among educated Westerners in India is that of the germination of seeds under the influence of prana directed by rhythmic breathing and concentrated will. This feat is entirely different from the mango feat and similar exhibitions along the lines of illusory mental influence as mentioned in the first part of this chapter, and in which there is no real sprouting or growth but only an appearance or illusion of the same. In the present case the germination is real, as evidenced by photographs and the preservation of the germinated sprout attached to the seed after the termination of the performance. It is unnecessary to say that in a feat of this kind the chances of sleight of hand are great, and that the investigators have taken means to obviate the chances of the same by employing the methods familiar to the investigators of psychic phenomena. In this feat the fakir takes seeds of certain quick-growing plants of India, which are brought by the investigators and which subsequent analysis shows to be free from foreign chemicals, and enclosing them with a handful of earth, likewise examined and afterward tested, holds the mass of earth in his hand for a space of about half an hour to an hour at the same time concentrating the prana upon it by means of rhythmic breathing and concentrated will. After a time there appears a tiny sprout of green working out of the earth, which is allowed to grow until it attains a height of several inches. Examination shows the remnants of the seed clinging to the sprout, as is the case in natural and normal germination and the presence of a tiny root which has been sent in the opposite direction to the sprout. The reports are that this feat has been performed frequently under the strictest test conditions, the elements of deception having been eliminated. The explanation given is that the energy of the prana operates precisely as do the rays of the sun in a tropical country, only in a more concentrated degree and that the energy employed and that contained in the sun's rays is identical. No heat is noticeable, but then the higher rays of sunlight are not heat rays, as all scientists know. Another point of resemblance to the actinic rays of the sun is shown in another feat in which the fakir places his hand on the fair skin of a newly arrived European or American, and after holding it there for about 15 minutes or a half hour leaves a sunburnt impression of his hand on the flesh of the fair skin visitor. We would like to hear of the experiment being tried of placing a covered sensitive photographic plate under the hand of the fakir so that it might be ascertained whether the imprint of his hand would appear thereon, as is the case when the x-ray is so applied but so far we have not heard of this last mentioned experiment having been attempted. In the germination feed it should be noticed that the seeds employed are always those of some native quick-growing plants of India many of which will sprout naturally in 24 hours under the rays of the Indian sun. Another feat performed by the same methods is that mentioned by a few people who have witnessed it, it being a rare one and one which is seldom manifested or exhibited, and which is known as the fish feat. It is performed by the fakir holding in his hand a glass or tiny bowl of water in which have been placed a few of the ova or eggs of small native fish, fertilized, of course and upon which he concentrates the prana for about half an hour, along the lines of the method stated above, the result being that the ova or eggs would hatch and produce tiny young fish swimming freely about in the glass or small bowl, just as if they had been hatched nationally, and in the usual time. The Hindu occultists held that this result is produced purely by the application of the power of concentrated prana, by means of rhythmic breathing and willpower, as was the germination of the seed the phenomena being identical. We have heard of a few isolated cases in which certain Hindu fakirs have been able to cause the hatching of the egg of small birds, quite a time however being necessary in such cases, in one instance the entire day, 12 hours, being necessary to produce the result. The principle in all of these cases is the same, the application of prana, which hastens the vital processes inherent in the germ of the seed or egg itself the work being performed along purely natural lines, merely being hastened or stimulated to a marked degree by the action of an increased and concentrated supply of prana. Another interesting manifestation of the same force is that which has been related by the travelers in certain parts of India, whereby the temperature of water is lowered to the extent of a number of degrees, 
not in the way of an actual subtraction of the heat by the direct action of prana, but in a manner similar to that of artificial refrigeration by evaporation. The method is as follows, the fakir takes into his hands, and at the same time rests upon his lap one of the large water jars common to all tropical countries, which is wrapped with cloths moistened with water, and which are usually placed in the sun that the heat may cause the water on the cloths to evaporate the evaporation drawing the heat from the water within the jar and thereby cooling it the process being according to well-known physical laws. The fakir, by directing a supply of prana upon the moistened cloths, which are re-moistened from time to time, manages to set up a process of evaporation similar to that mentioned in the boiling water feet, and this constant evaporation drawing the heat from the water within the jar gradually reduces it to a degree of coolness quite perceptible and agreeable to the taste. This manifestation shows quite plainly that prana is the force used, and gives us an additional proof of the nature of this class of phenomena. There are other cases, however, in which prana is used in an entirely different way, and in accordance to different laws of nature. We allude to the action at a distance in which bells are rung and objects moved as if by an unseen hand. Laying aside for a moment the cases in which this class of phenomena is produced by the projection of the astral body charged with prana, let us consider the cases in which the prana is directed along the lines of thought form projection, or vitalized thought. There are a number of feats produced in this way by the Hindu fakirs, some of which resemble some of the manifestations of the Western spiritualistic mediums. Bells are rung small objects are shifted in position, and the strings of musical instruments are sounded, etc., although the fakir is bound and surrounded by watchers. These manifestations are performed in a dim light, darkness not being deemed necessary as in the cases in which the astral manifestations are performed. In the latter cases there are conditions manifested which resemble the materializations of the Western spiritualists and in which in the dimly lighted room the form of the fakir is seen floating about, and in which the other physical manifestations are shown. In many cases the fakirs attribute the phenomena to spirits or disembodied entities, but in many cases they frankly admit that they go out of themselves in some way unknown to them, but which they produce by means of trance states, etc., and in which they find themselves able to move objects, etc., while their physical body is tied in a chair or while it reclines on the ground, held by some of the spectators. These seances resemble in many ways the spiritualistic seances of the West, and we shall not dwell upon them as they are not distinctively Hindu. As a matter of interest, we would note that many Western investigators now claim that much of the so-called spirit phenomena of the West is really caused by the unconscious astral projection of the medium, instead of by disembodied entities dwelling on other planes of being. If such be the case the West has stumbled on one of the methods of the Hindu fakirs, a fact which is most interesting and instructive. There is another class of phenomena manifested by these fakirs which is of a very different type, and which perplexes the majority of investigators, but which is thought to arise from the employment of prana in some peculiar way. We allude to the phenomenon of levitation whereby the body is caused to levitate or become so buoyant that it floats in the air as the body of the swimmer floats in the water. This phenomenon is not identical with a similar one caused by mental illusion, in which the spectators are made to imagine that they see the feet, but is an actual physical phenomenon duly attested to by numerous Western people in India, and which has also been manifested in other countries. It is generally attributed to a suppositious quality called levity which is held to be the opposite of gravity, and which counteracts the effect of the latter. But other authorities hold that gravity is not neutralized but rather is overcome by the effect of prana directed in a manner similar to the other feats. The fakir generally leans backward gradually, and when he begins to feel buoyant he calls upon the attendants to lift his heels from the ground and to support him in the air for a few moments, after which they withdraw leaving him suspended in the air. After a few minutes the fakir is generally able to move himself about to float in fact until the power gradually decreases and he sinks slowly to the ground. It must be remembered that he passes into a state of intense concentration, becoming oblivious to the outside surroundings, 
and at the same time he breathes rhythmically in slow measured time. In the above connection it is interesting to compare the above mentioned complete levitation with the partial levitation so often resulting from the familiar western experiment whereby a heavy person is lifted into the air by the fingertips of his companions who have been breathing rhythmically and in unison. While the process does not appear to come under the classification of the other feats performed by the use of prana, there seems to be very good ground for believing that in some way prana is employed to counteract the effects of gravity. The fakirs themselves seem to be at a loss to account for the phenomena, saying merely that they merely let themselves go, holding at the same time a strong mental image of suspension in the air and then hold themselves up by a concentrated effort of the will directed into the mental image, or thought picture. They claim that it tires them out in a short time, and that they can feel themselves giving out, just as under a physical strain. They acquire the means of producing the feat by frequent practice under the instruction of their masters in youth, but they also declare that some of the pupils never acquire the method at all, in spite of the instructions and practice and that the teachers are unable to induce the power where it does not exist naturally. They refuse, as they always do in any case, to describe the methods of practice, except to their own apprentices, and they refuse large sums of money for the secret which they have sworn to preserve. Under no circumstances would they betray the secret to an outsider, for they fear the vengeance of their particular deity or god, Shiva, for they belong to the credulous and superstitious portion of the race and are far from being advanced spiritually or intellectually. All of which goes to prove the contention of the developed and advanced occultists that these fakirs possess powers of low degree, and which have no connection with true soul power, which is possessed only by advanced individuals, and which depend upon a high degree of knowledge concerning the nature and powers of the soul. We will not take up space and time in endeavoring to explain the nature of prana and mental influence in this lesson. In the first series of our lessons, known as the 14 Lessons in Yogi Philosophy and Oriental Occultism, we have gone into the subject of these two forces, showing what prana is and how it is employed in connection with psychic influence. We would refer students to the lessons in the said book touching upon the forces named. But in order that this lesson, and the above references to prana and mental influence may be intelligible to the general reader, we feel that we should state briefly the nature of prana, and to describe the underlying principles of mental influence. Prana is the Sanskrit term used to designate that great natural force or energy which is universal in its manifestations, and which appears in the human being as vital force, or nerve force, in other words as the power which makes life action possible. This prana, although manifesting as vital force, is more than this it is the great power or energy or force which manifests in all things throughout the universe, showing now as electricity, now as light and heat, now as magnetism, now as gravitation, etc. In short, the energy principle of the universe prana may be, and is directed by the human will, to the different parts of the body as when the will commands the muscles to contract by means of a current of prana sent there and it may be projected beyond the limits of the body in certain forms of occult phenomenon. There are various forms of mental influence, as all students of the subject well know, but the form or phase which is manifested by the fakirs in the feats of illusion mentioned in the first part of this lesson 1. In the form of vibration and prana charged thought forms projected toward the spectators. The fakir has cultivated the power of mental imaging to a high degree, and then forming a thought form along the mold of his mental image, the same being charged with prana to give it vitality and force, by means of his concentrated will he projects it towards the circle of spectators, thus producing similar vibrations in their chitta or mind stuff which causes them to think they see in actual manifestation the scenes that the fakir has seen by mental imaging. It is as if the fakir was using a mental magic lantern containing a slide with the desired picture painted on it when the lantern ray strikes the surface of the brains of the other persons the scene is reproduced there, and they think that they are actually witnessing the scene of the lantern slide. This illustration is somewhat crude but it gives an idea of the process employed. References to our other series of lessons, as aforesaid, will give detailed explanation of the nature and laws of the phenomena of mental influence. In the wonder working of the Fakirs of India we have to deal with a great variety of feats and manifestations, which would require a large book to describe or even mention in detail. We have selected certain typical cases in order to illustrate the subject 
and have given you an explanation of the laws and principles underlying each, so that you may be able to distinguish between the various phases of the phenomena. We think that with our explanation you will be able to classify, distinguish and understand any particular feats of which you may hear henceforth. We wish to be distinctly understood, however, in stating that the explanations given do not apply to the higher class of phenomena manifested by the advanced masters and higher occultists of India, who have mastered the secret of many of nature's finer forces, and who employ the same from time to time for the good of humanity and the advancement of the race. These developed souls, however, never exhibit these powers for the purpose of satisfying the curiosity of travelers or others or even for the purposes of scientific investigation they hold themselves above these things and would scorn to give exhibitions for any such purpose. Some of their favored students have been able to witness some of these remarkable manifestations of power, during the course of their occult instruction in which the principles were applied in order to illustrate certain points of teaching. This class of phenomena belongs to another plane of life and activity and may be considered as spiritual in nature rather than mental or physical. And the acquirement of such power is possible only to those who have trodden the path of attainment and who have won the battle of self-mastery, which must precede the mastery of the finer forces. Many people make the mistake of confounding this higher phenomena with the manifestations just mentioned, or else the psychic phenomena of the astral plane, both of which are immeasurably below it in the scale. As we have said, Many of these lower powers are acquired by persons of but a low grade of spiritual attainment or development, and their success depends principally upon those commonly known but little used faculties concentration, perseverance, and work, to a degree uncommon to the average person who wishes to be shown a royal road to power, while no such road exists. Special Message 11 For this month, we invite you to taste of the spiritual wine of wisdom, from the grapes of understanding pressed forth by the Hindu sages of old, truth cannot be realized by want of spiritual strength nor by indifference nor by austerities unaccompanied by renunciation. The self of that knower who applied himself to truth, enters the great self. Sages have found it, and do thou stand ever content in spiritual consciousness remain thou ever centered in truth, being free from all attachment, and always at peace within and without. Find the unconditioned and operating and realizing the truth within you, become one with all, with faith firmly fixed on the truth with the mind purified through renunciation with the soul illumined with spiritual consciousness become one with the immortal one with the one. When thy mind reaches the stage of intuitive knowledge, follow thou it be led by the truth within thee. Until then, be thou guided by the best books, and the best teachers, and the logical instruments of knowledge though these be but as crutches, Yet wisdom dictates that they be not thrown away until outgrown. When latent desire is burnt out by the fire of the spirit, and the one is realized, then wilt thou have no concern with outward instruments of knowledge, however good these may be, these teachers, and books and logical reasonings. The rivers flowing to and gaining the ocean, lose themselves in it. Yea, lose even their name and form, and become one with the ocean and even bear its name. So do all the myriads of individual selves flow into and gaining the one, become lost in it, losing name and form, and being known by its name. This one, in which all is lost and by which losing all is found is the immortal, transcendent truth. In truth are all forms, like the centering of the spokes of the chariot wheel in its hub. Knowing truth, the great all-pervading one, through whom is experienced dream and waking the wise rise above pain, and sorrow, for wisdom neutralizes these illusions. Our meditation for the coming month is, the wise ever seek that which once known all is known.